morning and welcome everyone to Going Global. This is a webinar series by Edeon Science Park and Edeon Innovation. Today's session will be on Germany and we have more than 50 companies uh, signed up to listen in, so welcome. First, I want to introduce our guests. Um, I will start with our expert panel, Verena Adamheit and Peter Jung. Verena Adamheit, she's a senior project leader for market entry and business development at the Swedish German uh, Chamber of Commerce. In her job, Verena supports companies to get established in Germany. Peter Jung is a project manager at Business Sweden. He's a strategy consultant and has a track record of more than 100 projects focused on business development. Today, you will also meet Markus Nilsson from ECON, the Swedish export credit agency. Jonas Eborn, he's the CFO of Modellon. Julia Bayer, the CEO and co-founder of SunTribe. And Bo Uneus, he's the CEO and owner of Hugot. And a few words about myself. So my name is Lutze Buchmann. I'm from Germany, but I moved to the Öresund region three years ago. I work for the social enterprise Singe, and we consult our clients in business development. So part of what we do is actually help companies to enter new markets. At Singe, we have a special focus on sustainability. So we help impact startups to scale their sustainable solutions, and we help our clients to integrate sustainability into their business model. Currently, we have a joint project with Edeon Open, and we help a startup called Tide to build a global value chain for recycled ocean plastics. So I'm excited to be your moderator today and uh, let's get started with the program. This morning, we will cover the most important aspects companies need to consider before going global. First, a panel of experts will provide you with a five-step guide on how to enter the German market. And next, local entrepreneurs whose companies are already successful on the German market, will share their stories with you. We will welcome questions uh, during the whole webinar. So please feel free to just um, write your questions in the chat function, and then we will address them directly after each presentation. I will now hand over the word to our expert panel, Verena Adamheit and Peter Jung. So the first topic is, Good to know about the German market. And Verena will start um, with talking a little bit about what is typical for the German market. Thanks for having <laughs> me uh, today. It's uh, very exciting to be with you and tell you something about the German market. It's, of course, only a glimpse, and I'm very intrigued to see what the uh, testimonials will say. So uh, let's start with some uh, theory first. And my question is, uh, good to know about the German market. You already said it. And before we start right into the um, issue, I want to just mention who we are at the Chamber. Thank you for your kind words. So the International Chamber Network is a network that is all over the world. We have 79 chambers in Germany and we have 140 locations of foreign chambers abroad in 92 countries. And here in Sweden, we are, of course, the German Swedish Chamber of uh, Commerce with about 70 employees in Stockholm, Malmö, Malmö and uh, Gothenburg. And we are a member organization with about 1,200 member companies. And this makes us Sweden's largest binational chamber of commerce. So this is us. And now to the question, what is typical of the German market? Let's start with Germany overall. It's the fourth largest economy in the world. And due to its central location, your gateway to Europe, if you look at the European map, it's very hard to avoid Germany when you cross Europe from north to south or west to east. And I'm sure most of you have done it. So Germany is really in the middle and in the heart of Europe. And if you look at the map again, it is very close to you, which is, of course, very convenient. It's a very close market and you all know probably that Germany is Sweden's single largest individual trade partner, which is exciting, of course. And, and the best thing is the Germans love Sweden. Uh, you have a, what we call in German a Sweden bonus. 
the Germans are very fascinated of Sweden and the traditions and the midsummer trees. And they think of Ikea and Astrid Lindgren and Pippi Longstockings. So you have a store, a big plus when you come to Germany and you come from Sweden. Everyone will smile, which is a very good start. So this was Germany uh, in general. So now let's have a look at some maps which show different aspects of Germany. And I want to start with this map, which shows you that Germany is a federal structured country and thus a very heterogeneous market. And you see two numbers on the upright corner. It says 83 and it says 16. So Germans are 83 million inhabitants in 16 different, not countries, but federal states. We call it Bundesländer in Germany. It's not as federal as the US, but is a federal country which has implications to your business, not, not uh, only legal, but there are differences in every country. So you really need to make sure which country, which Germany, you choose if you want to establish yourself in Germany. The second factor that I want to mention is the German Mittelstand. And you see in the down right corner, it has even an own logo. Mittelstand is the economy's backbone, it's the heart of the economy. And unlike Sweden, where you have a lot of small scale countries and a lot of big scale countries in Germany, the essence of the economy is the medium sized companies. And medium size, according to the EU definition, is not more than 250 employees and uh, about 50 million euro annual turnover. But this quantitative criteria are very blurry because there's um, smaller, there's bigger companies. But the essence is that you have quantitative and qualitative criteria to be part of the Mittelstand. And the quality criteria are that you have uh, to have a family owned structure of the company and the family is running the company as well. And additionally, you are financially independent. So you have strong muscles and you can make decisions, which is very important for you if you want to contact the kind of company from the Mittelstand. And we often have companies that call and say, I want to go to Germany, please make a contact to Siemens. Could be right, Siemens is great, but a Mittelstand company could be way better for you to enter the market because they can make this decisions. They have the money and they are the companies that drive innovation. So please think of the German Mittelstand and you find a lot of hidden champions, what we call the hidden champions in Germany, here in the Mittelstand, which means that they are leading or top three leading in their branch, in their niche all over the world. No one really knows about them. So the hidden champions are the ones. Now, for you that are into B2C, I want to show you a map of inhabitants of uh, Germany. And here you can see what we call the banana structure, which runs from Hanover over Düsseldorf, Köln, Bonn, Stuttgart, Ulm, and even Munich. So you hear the names, it's big cities, and we have a lot of big cities per definition in Germany. So here they are most of the people living. So if you are in B2C, go where your customers are. Please choose the Bundesland where you have your customers. So have this banana in mind. On the other hand, if you are in B2B, please look at this map. Here you see the more green, yellow, reddish it gets, the more employees are working in industry. And here again, you see Southwest is more industrial than the Northeast. So if you want to contact industry, please make sure that you choose the right Bundesland again. On the other hand, if you want to establish a company or a production site in um, Germany and you need a lot, lot of space, Northeast Germany could be very interesting for you. And by the way, there's a lot of promotion um, money to receive from especially Eastern Germany. So again, look at your German map to get it right. Speaking of industry cluster, I'd like to have a short look at some specific clusters that we have in Germany to enable you to choose right your right location. 
So we start with Berlin. Of course, there are a lot of headquarters. We have ICT here. We have pharmaceuticals and the creative industry and a lot of startups. You probably know it yourself. Berlin is very attractive and young, creative, innovative people are striving to live in Berlin. And this makes the essence of this, this Hauptstadt, this, uh, this city, which doesn't have a lot of industry otherwise. Continuing to Hamburg, closest to uh, Sweden, we have PR and publishing here. We have life sciences and logistics with Europe's next biggest harbor, of course, and the space industry with uh, Airbus. And speaking of PR and publishing, you might know the Springer Verlag, which is very, very big and very important in uh, Germany. We continue to NRV, which is North Rhine-Westphalia. Here we ha have a lot of ICT, medtech, logistics. We have um, Europe's biggest interior harbor in Duisburg, which is in NRV. Chemistry, we have Bayer, and we have a lot of media. And by the way, most of the Swedish companies which are establishing themselves in Germany are going to North Rhine-Westphalia. So you have a lot of companions there if you choose North Rhine-Westphalia there. Frankfurt. Banking and finances, of course, with the ECB and logistics, if you think of the Frankfurt airport. And now it's uh, very obvious, obvious Stuttgart, automotive and engineering. And I only need to mention Daimler and Bosch, uh, for example. But Stuttgart, Baden-Württemberg, a lot of hidden champions in this uh, Bundesland. Last but not least, it's München, automotive, of course, with BMW, engineering, insurance, Munich Re, Allianz, if you um, know them, and ICT as uh, well. And if you remember Bayern, the closest uh, or the most southern uh, country, it says with laptop and Lederhose. Lederhose is this classical Bavarian leather outfit for the, uh, for the man. So with laptop and uh, Lederhose. So again, look at the map, look at which cluster you fit in best and choose the right location. Last slide from my side before Peter takes over. Trends and upcoming. What's happening in Germany? It is, of course, digitalization. Uh, I heard someone say uh, COVID has done more for digitalization than five years promotion program of the federal department. Uh, it's probably true. So digitalization is all around. It's not administration, it's e-health, it's the industry, all these branches I mentioned uh, down there. So it's really the one topic. Industry 4.0, much be spoken about. Um, it is really still on the agenda and we are continuing to have this fully digitalized industry production. Energy vendor. Very important because now we have sufficient or close to sufficient with renewable energy, but we have to integrate it. So it's a lot of sector coupling. It is uh, smart metering. The rollout has started. It is smart grids. And it's above all now the challenge with transforming the transport and the heat sector. So if you have something innovative here, it is most welcome in Germany. Last, biotech life sciences e-health, you may have read Pfizer and BioNTech, uh, a German company have issued one of the new vaccinations against COVID. So this is very booming in Germany. And one of the branches which um, has kind of an upswing due to the actual pandemic. So this is also very important. I think I stopped there. Uh, I stopped sharing my screen. And I uh, hand over to Peter. My name is uh, Peter Young. I'm from Business Sweden. Um, I work within uh, the Central Western Europe hub, focusing on uh, mainly Germany, but also the Benelux countries in Switzerland. And I've uh, been, been working within business development, helping Swedish companies go abroad for the past nine years. And um, uh, the slide that I wanted to show you now, uh, it goes a little bit in, and hopefully I can show you later during another discussion or for the next discussion, I can just briefly show it to you again. Um, it touches upon that what Verena uh, already spoke about and also showed, which are uh, what we say are the three overarching transformational uh, themes in Germany, which would be uh, starting off with the uh, digital decade, 
um, the decade of sustainable action and a reinvention of innovation. And uh, what we mean with the first one, a digital decade, is of course uh, the digitization in Germany, which is a little bit always the uh, a, a funny notion of uh, the reason why usually our, our Zoom calls and team meetings uh, when calling it from Germany are a little bit um, uh, non-perfect, let's say, because the the fiber the fiber backbone and the internet connections um, they're not the same as in the Nordic countries. And it's a little bit from day-to-day -day basis. Um, and uh, in general, there's been a, a huge upswing when it comes to the digitization in all fields in Germany, whether it is fintech, um, whether it is uh, software for retail or uh, B2C uh, uh, software solutions and applications. Um, generally, generally speaking, Germany has always been a little bit more restrictive when it comes to the usage of digital services when, when you compare it to others. But um, especially within the last maybe 24 uh, months, and of course during the pandemic time now, there's been a huge investment from the private sector and the public sector, um, and even more commitment so from the public sector invest in digital solutions. And we see a real upswing when it comes to um, uh, not only being able to provide uh, solutions to the industry as such, as a provider from the Swedish side, but also that uh, when it comes to issues concerning um, regulations, that uh, it is more up for discussion now uh, from the political side so that more digital solutions will be able to, to function in, in Germany long term. Uh, the other one that I mentioned was the, uh, the sustainable actions. Sustainability is, of course, a huge issue in Germany, um, not only looking from top down a little bit from the political uh, spectrum, where um, all the nuclear facilities will be shut down at the latest in 2022. And that has a trickle down effect uh, for the whole economy. Germany is investing heavily in renewable energies. Then you can have, of course, different opinions how fast it is going and uh, what measures exactly are being taken. But the, the aim and the goal from, from the political side, which again has a trickle down effect on the private sector, is of course substantial and it does have effect and there is a lot of money involved so uh, every every solution that has some kind of uh, sustainable measure or focus on sustainability is is usually or usually gets more traction in germany than it used to um, one example a little bit more maybe concrete is um, to, to give you a notion that it's not only uh, within energy uh, we also work with companies within retail, uh, for instance, and also there, the, the usage of uh, sustainability, uh, which, which at least when I, when I started with this work nine years ago, wasn't a big issue, um, has really gained traction the past, uh, the past I'd say, 24 months. And uh, even the biggest wholesalers now say that it's an issue that they have a look at when looking at supply chain or also certifications. And then, of course, the last one um, coming up on, on the 25 minute mark here, um, the reinvention of innovation. So every, Germany has always been the forefront of innovation, especially within the SME sector, as Rena said, the Mittelstand backbone. Um, and Germany has always wanted to position themselves, and they, they are, as an R&D country, um, which means regardless of the industry, if you're into um, uh, new innovation and, and finding new partners uh, and, and also trying out new, new products, um, Germany is a good market for that. And uh, there is um, a lot of opportunity when it comes to, to new technology, new innovation. So next point in the program will be a testimonial. We will hear from Jonas Ebon, the CFO of uh, Modellon. Modellon has many years of experience in the German market. Their business in Germany started with a partnership in Lund, then grew with a local part-owned subsidiary in Munich, 
And con today consists of a 100% owned subsidiary with offices in Munich and in Hamburg. So please, Jonas, I will hand over the word to you. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invite to uh, join the session. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to do a, a brief history, more or less, and uh, of course introduce uh, Modlon. So uh, I think we're not very well known in Sweden. We're actually a, already a global company, uh, but with our roots in Lund, we started uh, 15 years ago as a spin-off from the Department of Automatic Control in uh, LTH. So I got my uh, PhD from there and uh, together with some colleagues, uh, and one uh, partner also from uh, KTH. We uh, started this in uh, late 2004 and then 2005 was the first year of business. What we do is uh, software and services for model-based simulations, a very high-tech area. And uh, the software that we provide is for innovation, design and operation of technical systems. And you can see some of the industrial areas that we work in, we have a global customer base. And uh, actually the first customers that we started with were in Germany. So that's sort of a, a very dear market to us. And today we have 100 employees, 10 sites in five different countries with uh, local uh, entities, local companies in those countries. And the latest uh, step on our journey is uh, our uh, product model on impact. We launched it this uh, summer and it's a web-based simulation platform. So we've been providing software since the start, uh, but now we're going to the cloud. So the uh, model on impact software platform is offered as a software as a service solution uh, for everyone. And we, uh, we feel that that will give us a, a base for uh, going even further uh, globally and, uh, uh, and grow faster than we've done so far. Although we've done pretty good uh, in the 15 years. And uh, I'll go forward here and uh, we can see a little bit uh, more on the uh, details in how our journey in Germany specifically started. So actually, uh, it was an initiative from the German automotive industry that kicked off uh, our history. Uh, there is an organization called the VDA. It's a German automotive uh, collaboration. Uh, organization. Uh, and they, uh, within a uh, uh, working group there, they wanted to standardize on simulation tools for uh, air conditioning simulation in, uh, in the automotive industry. And this was done as a benchmark. And uh, we were fresh out of, uh, uh, fresh out of uh, university and uh, uh, actually had worked on energy simulation, simulation of energy systems. So uh, together with a partner, Dynasim in Lund, uh, we entered this uh, benchmark and won it in a competition with some, uh, uh, some um, large commercial companies. Uh, and this really uh, started our journey. We uh, established Modlon, uh, registered that, and then uh, for the first three, uh, few years, we really went through uh, Dynasim as a partner channel selling to Germany and Sweden and any, or any other countries, mainly to automotive, also to uh, the energy market. Um, and I can mention that uh, I heard from um, Trentia that uh, the Germany is the heart of uh, a European market. And I can testify that that's really true. We've uh, sort of gone through Germany to Switzerland, Austria, Czech Republic, uh, so it is uh, very important to uh, have a, a base there. Um, our further journey uh, went on with a, a local partner in uh, Munich in 2009. So there we had a part owned a joint company uh, that we could grow very quickly together with a, a local partner. Uh, for example, working with BMW, which is a huge uh, industry, of course, in, in Munich. And this one, uh, with this, we, we could grow very quickly, grow our services and also uh, sell more uh, software in, uh, in the German market. Uh, from Germany, we also established in the US and, and Japan. Uh, that's not part of this uh, history here, 
uh, but uh, I can also mention that uh, we've worked with uh, Business Sweden in many places, uh, not in Germany, but uh, definitely in US and Japan. Uh, in Germany, of course, we had a local partner from the start. And currently, uh, we have reestablished with our own fully owned uh, company in, uh, in Germany. So the uh, partnership with a, a local owner in Munich, since uh, we didn't have full control over that company, this was actually uh, sold to um, uh, another partner in, uh, in 2015. So then now we have uh, our own control of our own destiny in the market. Uh, and uh, although we're not as big, uh, we have uh, currently five employees in Munich and Hamburg, uh, we have big plans. And it's very important that um, to have that local footprint also to tie back to uh, the uh, discussion about the Bundesländer, uh, I would say that uh, these two uh, uh, locations, Munich and Hamburg, they're at the extremes of the uh, German market. Uh, Bavaria and, and Hamburg, that's sort of uh, very different uh, markets, uh, both from a, a sort of industrial uh, point, but mainly I think because uh, it's a Catholic and Protestant area. So uh, from the people you find there and also from uh, just the rules, for example, about holidays, uh, they're very different. So you need to know about these local differences in, uh, in different areas of, of uh, Germany. And um, I will just conclude. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm doing very good in time. So. Uh, I don't need to speed up so much, but we will have some time to discuss with Lucia also. Uh, so what I found is important in the German market and what's been important for us. Uh, so many, many collaborations. Uh, actually what spawned Modlon is a standardization effort. This was something we were um, very active in during our uh, PhD time in, uh, in LTH. Uh, Modelica Association is an organization that promotes uh, modeling and simulation, physical modeling with an equation uh, based language. And we're still very active in this. And there are many large German companies and also German universities that are active in the Modelica Association. So this has been a, a good uh, place for us to uh, sort of engage and uh, find also uh, new, uh, uh, new partnerships. And partnering with customers has been really important. We have a, a long collaboration from the start with this uh, German automotive organization that I mentioned. Uh, also uh, working with those uh, local champions, finding the right contact in a company is uh, certainly very, very important. And if you can establish that relation, uh, then you will have a, a sort of a good path forward to grow your business. And then resellers, we have uh, had a partnership in Sweden, of course, uh, but then also with uh, local resellers in, uh, in Germany. So large and uh, medium sized companies that are active in our technology area. And uh, we have also long collaborations there. Um, the local presence, I would say is also very important. So we started really with the uh, partnership in Munich uh, to really grow and uh, get to know your customers. It is important to have a local office. Uh, that may be changing a little bit now, but I think it's still important for at least a growth path uh, if you really want to um, uh, get more customers in an area. And as a final point, language, I, I do uh, think that's uh, important. Germans, uh, they know uh, English, of course. You can always communicate in English but it's a different thing to be comfortable in English. Uh, so I don't speak German myself, I understand it, uh, but I can't really communicate well, but we have many uh, co-founders, uh, uh, my colleagues from uh, LTH, uh, one of them is German and also many uh, of our employees are German. So it's important to have uh, that knowledge to be able to communicate uh, sort sort things out when uh, there's red tape to cut through. Uh, some of the customers that we have in Germany are, of course, much, much larger than, than we are. Siemens, for example, and Daimler and others. Uh, 
and just uh, sort of finding our path in uh, that uh, administration that uh, can come with the large companies sometimes. It's important to have uh, local knowledge and local, uh, uh, local language. And I'll just, uh, so this is actually the image here. Uh, I've just picked a few from uh, some slides we have, but this is the uh, uh, portfolio of different uh, libraries that we're selling to our customers. So this is for simulation of different uh, areas of, uh, of engineering. So thermal, uh, aerospace, mechanical simulation, uh, electrical propulsion, uh, the tools that we work with in, um, in simulation software is really a, a general simulation tool. So we can uh, address a lot of the market, uh, although not uh, every, everything yet. And I'll just close with where we are today. So this is the uh, model on sites in uh, five different countries. Uh, Czech Republic is actually a site, although we don't have a registered company there. And you can see some of the companies that we work with, uh, a lot of very large global companies uh, that we've uh, sort of uh, started collaborations with uh, over the years. And we're very proud to uh, continue our uh, our journey together with these companies. So I will stop there. Uh, actually, we have a few minutes. So Lutia, if you have any questions or if there's any questions from, uh, from the participants. Yes, thank you so much, Jonas. Um, and we haven't received any questions from the audience yet, but even if you can think of a question later, feel free to just um, put it into the chat. And um, so from my side, um, just based on your personal experience, I mean, you touched upon a few different topics now, but are there some specific learnings you want to share with the companies who are listening in today and who are looking to enter the German market? So uh, I would say German companies are in, in general uh, relatively easy to work with, uh, easy to uh, understand. Uh, uh, they're in some sense very similar to uh, Swedish companies and, and Swedes in general. Uh, a little bit more, maybe more formal in some sense, uh, I would say that, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, it, especially when you're working with uh, large companies that there could be some more administration that uh, you think is a little bit annoying, uh, but uh, it's worth it in the end, definitely. And also very loyal. Uh, so uh, when you have a, a tool or a solution uh, that they need, uh, they will keep working with you. Uh, that's very important. Um, from a personal standpoint, and not uh, sort of specifically for Germany, I would uh, say that um, jumping on opportunities, it's very important. The, the opportunity that we got in 2004 uh, was a little bit by chance, but just taking that, um, taking that chance uh, and, and going for it. That's, uh, now uh, we've come to a company with 100 employees. Uh, at the time, uh, I was actually living in the US, so I moved back to Sweden to start the company and uh, worked uh, for three or four months without any pay uh, to, to get this established. But it was uh, uh, an opportunity that we felt was worth pursuing, and it was really the German market that, that made it possible. So. Uh, that's, that's very interesting to hear. Um, yeah. And we received one more question from the audience. How did you find uh, your collaboration and how did you start your local office? Um, and was it through standardization conferences? Yes, yeah, so actually uh, the Modelic Association is a, a special type of association. So it's a, uh, it's a standardization effort that comes from industry and it comes from, uh, from universities uh, with origins in Lund actually. The, uh, uh, effort started mid 90s when I was a PhD student. Uh, so a, a lot of that, it comes from there. It comes from uh, also uh, the uh, partnerships with like Dynasim that we worked with there. They uh, were working with customers in, in Germany. Um, uh, and also there uh, sort of being a participant in some of these 
conferences, uh, standardization efforts that takes time, of course, but it also gives you opportunities. So uh, I would say that's a, a, a good place to start. Uh, and uh, there's, there's no silver bullet here. There's no uh, one place to start, but uh, it's definitely uh, places where we have uh, sort of come, uh, come a long way uh, starting there. Thanks a lot. Uh, we received one more question. Mm -hmm. How much business in Germany did you see before opening a partnership office? Um, the office that we started with, that was uh, the sort of joint effort, so 50-50 effort. Uh, the uh, partner that we had there uh, really uh, already had some customers. Uh, so I would say we uh, started with uh, uh, we started with uh, something that maybe uh, was uh, covering five employees locally. Uh, and that was a good seed uh, for getting the office started. And then we grew quickly from five to 50 uh, in uh, four to five years. So, uh, but I would say that's a sort of a, uh, the initial seed needed. Um, then uh, once, when we restarted our business and just uh, opened our own 100% owned business, then we already had a couple of employees that were German, that were local. Uh, so then we could actually go just with uh, sort of one or two persons, but then uh, we already had the customers, we knew the market and we already had the local employees. Uh, so the uh, formal, uh, company registration uh, was just that more of formal formality to be able to grow our own business uh, from that point. And that's from uh, 20, 2015 until now. So we had sort of a, a local footprint, but we do most of the business from Sweden with the uh, local employees uh, sort of taking the responsibility to meet the customers. Thanks a lot, Jonas. This was um, very insightful. And thank you for answering the questions as well. Okay, so we thank will, you. We will move on to the next um, point of the agenda now. So as we, as we heard, it is essential to use the right networks when entering a new market. And an integral part of that is also getting familiarized with cultural aspects. So now we will dive into a few of those aspects with a panel on how to do business with the German. So I will hand over the word to our experts again, Peter and Verena. Very good. So a little bit, I, I can just uh, actually go back to um, what I wanted to show the first time around, if you would want to see it uh, black or white on, on the slide, but you, you will be receiving all this uh, after the, the webinar. Uh, but here you can see it again, a little bit what I spoke about, the three different overarching transformations and then um, a little bit more um, the specific trends that you can have a look on, uh, look at uh, later on. But what I'm going to be focusing on right now, um, as you said, a little bit, uh, what does the German consumer think and, and how, how do they work um, when doing business here? Uh, you, can, you can tackle it from many different aspects. But uh, here we have uh, some, some general info uh, that uh, we've of course gained through personal experience but also through all the uh, projects that we have done with numerous clients and also some a little highlight uh, from from a study of course due to the uh, COVID-19 situation and the whole uh, transformation that that has brought uh, as well but in general um, uh, when and this is of course uh, mainly looking at B2C but and um, don't forget B2B it, it's, it's they're also regular people and, and influenced by German culture. So it's applicable for both B2C and B2B in a way. Um, but in, in a German consumer more, more than uh, often is extremely price sensitive. Um, you can find several different statistics uh, between countries if you, if you wanna have a look, um, you, can, you can Google that and there's no uh, uh, magic uh, statistics that, that's more wrong or right, but 
Um, pretty much everyone that you that you see when you when you look at it is always that uh, the German consumer is more price sensitive than than the typical uh, consumer in Western Europe, at least. And also, um, when it comes to a huge cultural difference, is um, uh, the the purchasing process of a consumer and how many steps they 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 have before they actually purchase uh, a, pro a product. Uh, looking at uh, different uh, reviews, um, looking at different prices, comparing. Um, all that is part of the due diligence, as I mentioned here on this slide, the due diligence that they do before uh, purchasing a, a product. Um, they know a lot about the product and that goes actually also the other way around when uh, having B2B conversations um, and B2B, of course, negotiations. They do a lot of due diligence on your a company on your product on your services whatever it is that you provide and uh, it has happened that we have uh, been participating at meetings with clients of ours and um, they were uh, a little bit taken aback by how much the german company already knew about the, com the swedish company and how well prepared in a way they were uh, which is not a negative thing but it's it, it can become a negative thing if you're not of course uh, prepared for it I mentioned already a little bit uh, the reviews and certifications, but that is, of course, a huge thing uh, here in Germany. Um, there are several different sites. Uh, certifications, regardless of industry, is always very interesting and relevant. Um, if you can show it on your website, if you can show it on your, on your product, um, there are, of course, national um, certifications, depending on the industry and product and service, once again, it all depends. But uh, you can almost be certain that there is some type of a little uh, trust button or trust certificate or whatever it may be um, that it it is um, something that that you will have to check out uh, for germany also uh, in in general all your information regarding the product and uh, the uh, the sales material towards the client and towards of course the the uh, the possible partner everything should be in german um, not only because Germany is a huge market, for, as, as we said before, the fourth largest economy in the world, but also um, it, it has to do with cultural aspects as well. You are the, the, the party coming to, to Germany um, and not the other way around. You want something to happen, not the other way around. So you should adjust and speak the local language. Um, just also want to mention something about uh, uh, the... Uh, the uh, consumer behavior and, and the transformation of the past eight months, maybe. It has been a huge transformation from a very offline, a typical offline um, consumer behavior in Germany, where we've seen some, some clear trends towards digitization, sure enough. But uh, as in many countries, I presume, even in Germany, if you, can, if you look at all different statistics from all the different uh, industries and trade um, organizations, you see that um, the, the amount of people using, using digital services or are now willing to use it, uh, both B2C and B2B has skyrocketed. Um, meaning also, of course, that uh, they are now, not, not only are they accustomed to use, to use it um, during the, the pandemic, but I've also read reports that uh, roughly 60, 70% want to keep it this way or at least keep the benefits of it even after the pandemic is, is over, if you will. So there is a huge possibility, especially within the field of digitization um, in Germany because the awareness of the services uh, has just uh, opened up and, and been, been presented as being more beneficial to, to all, all parties. And I think, um, very short also, we had a, a business climate survey that we did in more than 20 countries where, where we interviewed with different, uh, so not, not only business we involved, uh, different, uh, dif uh, different Swedish of course, subsidiaries in all 20 countries. And um, here we have a little snapshot from the results from the German market. And I, what I want you a little bit to focus on, you can take everything in, but uh, what you can focus on just for curiosity also for you would be a top right the challenges of the German market um, and maybe also at the bottom in the middle in the, the yellow one the success factors 
So this is, of course, the perspective from Swedish subsidiaries in Germany, saying that the challenges for the German market, that as they perceived it, were regional differences, high labor costs. But then I think the, the, the latter one here, the bias for German solutions, is also when going back to consumer behavior in Germany, um, something to, to think about. And um, don't forget that, of course, the Swedishness is, is very attractive in Germany. Um, but the bias for German solutions may, st may stem from, from of course, uh, typical um, biases that every country has for its own solutions. Um, but how you sometimes can overcome that is going back to what I said previously with uh, getting those German certificates, uh, translating it in German, making it a trustworthy product or service that, that you provide. And then, of course, the, the sales uh, factors uh, out of those three, I think, relevant here, not all of them are relevant, but I, I think I, I would highlight again the collaboration with, with uh, customers and um, trying to be close to customers because that then actually goes back to what I mentioned before about the bias for German solutions. So the closer you are with customers and you more adapt your, the more you adapt your product and services, um, we have seen, a, a, of course, a tendency that uh, the higher the, the, the trust then also becomes and, and the, the effectiveness of selling it on the local market. That's a little bit what I just wanted to, to oh, go back, sorry. That's a little bit the, the last minute I want to, to have and then handing it over to, to the next question and to Verena. First, a big thank you to Jonas. You said the Germans are loyal, formal and love to speak German. That's uh, great. That's basically <laughs> not it, but uh, it's uh, it's very much. So um, let's go into a bit of more uh, detail. And I just want you to close your eyes for a second uh, and think of the typical German. So what do you see? You see maybe a Bratwurst or an Autobahn where we drive very fast. You may see a Besserwisse, which we sometimes can be, and you probably think of Ordnung. So whatever you saw when you closed your eyes, you have a very clear image of a German um, in your head, which is probably stereotypical, but um, probably true, but it's not all. You see the iceberg here in the um, background, there's a lot of more, and I want to uh, profit from the occasion to tell you a bit, um, what we recommend, what you have to think of when you go to Germany. And the thing is, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. So please have this in mind, whatever you think or whatever you um, remark in Germany, it's from your own eyes and from the Swedish specialties as well. So the first thing is, of course, be prepared and be prepared that there is differences is closeness is closeness misleads uh, we spoke about that germany is so germany is so close um, and it's of course closer than japan or china where we all know that there are big intercultural differences is so the differences between sweden and germany are not that big as jonas already mentioned but they are differences and um it's one of these things is um, the ordner say, say uh, uh, do we say in um, Sweden, but the German doesn't think, think so. Uh, Jonas said, um, once they've embraced you, they stick to you. And this requires that they feel secure with you. So please give them all the information that they need. And here I gave you some of the instruction manual, which is very, very detailed. So Germans want to know a lot about you to make sure that they feel secure with you having a partner and they will have a lot of questions so please answer them and don't say oh yes i have to look it up uh, if you meet a german please make sure that you're ready because you don't get get a second chance to make a good first impression so that's very important the next thing is hierarchy models you all know about the german hierarchy thing and i also want to say this changes um, these hierarchy models are blurring, are softening because the next generation takes over with a startup environment. You don't have these hierarchies, but if you go to 
companies, which are more formal, bigger companies, and even the traditional Mittelstand companies, hierarchy is important. And the Swedish model on the right hand side, where you have the primus inter pares, doesn't apply. In Germany, it's hierarchy and the boss makes a decision and uh, you expect a boss to make a decision. So please have this in mind. The next thing is communication. Um, Swedes tend to be very modest, lagom, uh, but in Germany you have to stick out, you have to make a point, you have to let people know what your USP is, why are you best, why are you the best partner possible, so you really have to convince to stick out with all the 83 millions out there, so please make a stand and try not to be so modest and shy. And the good thing is, um, Germans tend to give a concrete answer. If Germans say um, yes or no, they mean yes or no. Um, so you get a concrete answer of uh, what's going on. Next thing, knowledge sharing. And I realized that something is uh, going wrong with my presentation. So I hope we can uh, get back to it. So next thing is knowledge sharing. In Germany, you say, um, Wissen ist Macht. So please be aware of this. Don't share every information with everyone. Please make sure that you communicate with the right persons. Again, it's, um, it's softening, but these are some uh, hints that I would like uh, to give you. And I see we have one minute left. So I stop sharing and I'm happy to receive questions. Thank you both. Um, we had one question coming in after Peter uh, spoke um, about certifications. Is it relevant with technical certifications in your business or is also general certifica certifications like ISO and others interesting uh, for them? Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, the, the basic premise is uh, ISO and, and the European standards and the, the international standards are um, good enough. However, um, uh, it does happen, and I don't know where which exact industry the question comes from, but um, that uh, the partner or a certain customer will want the, the national standard. Um, so it's not a mandate, but maybe for a certain customer or, or partner, it's on an uh, individual level then. Again, this Thanks is a matter of security for the Germans. Would you like to expand on that, Verena? No, I just wanted um, to mention that this again is a matter of security to make Germans feel secure that they know that you have the required standards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, this was it from the questions, uh, but feel free to post more if you like. And maybe uh, we can do it very briefly, but uh, just from both of you, one comment, how to find business partners in Germany? We always recommend find partners and get help. Uh, this is also something that Jonas mentioned, uh, find partnerships to make a first step into the market and um, be prepared and use partners for example the chambers um all the chambers they have uh, people working for your business to be established in germany and as i mentioned we have 79 chambers in germany so contact them and say hi i'm here uh, i want to establish my business please help me of course we can help as well but um find partners yeah and i can only uh, reiterate that uh, from our perspective um, I think staying proactive is the most important part and not being uh, passive. So um, there are many different ways. If you, if you want to go to trade fairs, uh, you want to go, uh, as Verena mentioned, uh, through networks with the Chamber of Commerce. You can work with consultants as well. Um, Chamber of Commerce does that. We do that as well, that we proactively find partners for you. Um, you can also, of course, use your internal network and see whoever has contacts in Germany. Um, I think that the, 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 the only thing not to do is being passive and, and just hope that uh, because of um, Google AdWords and, and other online activity that you do, that people will find you. 
and you have to do the work yourself and it will take time and and uh, a lot of people will not respond to you if you reach out proactively um, and you have to sim simply stay stay on it thank you for mentioning trade first peter because uh, we didn't spoke uh, speak about that it's very tricky in this actual situation but this is an excellent opportunity to both be exhibitor to show who you are to German customers, but go to a trade fair, which is specific for you. And there are a lot of trade fairs in Germany, just to go forward and say, hi, this is me. This is excellent. Thank you both. Um, we have one more question that we're going to take quickly. Um, how do we find and best contact the hidden champions, the family owned businesses for collaboration and maybe seed funding? Uh, what is the general attitude towards startups? Hi, uh, Christel. I, I see your questions. Yes, hidden champions, they are uh, hard to find because they are not very well known, which is one of the <laughs> things uh, with the hidden champions. Again, try to find partners that can help you, guide you through. Both, it can be a, a chamber, it can be a, another consultant, it could be Business Sweden, it could be some of the agencies that are all around there. And I even want to uh, mention the investment promotions agencies of the uh, um, individual Bundesländer. Every Bundesland has an investment promotion agency and our partner, the Germany Trade and Invest, also can guide you through and help your partner. And they even advise you on funding and seed funding and can guide you through networks. And we also do that, of course. Uh, and the general attitude towards startups, uh, where do you say startups um, are uh, in everyone's mouth? Uh, sometimes it's a bit tricky because a startup can mean so much. It can mean very early stage. It can mean uh, the, uh, the seed stage, which is a bit tricky because people want to see proof of concept. They want to see that uh, you have a proven product. So if you're late stage, a uh, late stage startup is different than the early stage startup. So um, it can be different, but uh, Swedish startups have a very good uh, reputation. Uh, yeah, and I, I simply would agree with what Rina said. I think the only thing I would uh, add is to have a, have a look at startup hubs in Germany. Um, it's not always, I, I know that the similar in other countries as well, but the, the communication between the networks in different cities is not always optimal. So uh, you have to also here do your work, whether it's in, in say you're in Munich and then going to, to Berlin. Um, of course, there are individual connections here and there, but as in, as in Sweden as well, a lot of the startup community, uh, community is on an individual level always, as well. And uh, the formal the formal networks usually are more constricted and constrained to the actual city itself. Thank you both. Uh, this was very interesting. Uh, we have a couple of more questions, and we will try to take those uh, later uh, when we have time left. Um, otherwise, feel free to to post your answers in the chat function as well, and then we can get back to it later. As of now, um, I'm happy to introduce um, our second testimonial, Julia Bayer, the CEO and co-founder of SunTribe. SunTribe is a young startup company and from the early beginning, they had a strong focus on internationalization. How successful are they on the German market? Julia will now share her experience with us. Thanks for, for the introduction. And um, yeah, so welcome everybody and uh, Good morning from Portugal. <laughs> um, I'm uh, happy to share my experience uh, from entering the German market with uh, SunTribe and uh, tell you about some learnings that we made and some mistakes that we made. Um, so as you can see here, we were a team of three founders when we started SunTribe in 2017 at Lund University. And uh, when we started, we had a, a single product, which you can see in the middle here. Uh, it's a sink sunscreen specifically for surfers and water sports. And what's special about it is that it is very pure. So it, it's only based on natural and organic ingredients and doesn't have any additives and um, only has mineral UV filters um, instead of chemical UV filters. And that makes it safe for the environment, especially coral reefs and for human health. Um, so that was the starting point in 2017. Um, 
and uh, we also started with basically zero funds um, which is going to be important later on um, and we knew from the start that we had to internationalize quickly because it was the beginning of the of the summer season when we started but uh, the summer is not so long in Sweden uh, and we knew we had to get international customers right away and Germany was an, an obvious market because of its size and because the Germans love to travel. And the, the one asset that we had was that I'm a, a native German speaker. And uh, yeah, like I, I grew up in Munich. And it was also very funny to hear some of the, the insights into the, into the German culture. I can definitely confirm uh, many of the, the prejudice that is the Ordnung, uh, the love for order. Um, yeah, and uh, we encountered some challenges when we started to try selling to B2B customers in Germany. So we just found that we contacted a whole bunch of companies, but we just didn't, didn't get through. We were just a small startup from Sweden. We had one product in the beginning, then we had four, um, and we just yeah didn't get through the, to the, the right contact persons. Um, and also with some companies that we did um, get into contact with and where we negotiated some uh, deals, we just couldn't offer the margins and the marketing budgets that they were asking for um, at this moment. Um, and we also quite quickly noticed that the German customers are really picky and don't have um, like a bonus for green products, at least in 2017, that was um, the feedback that we got. So they basically expected us to have a completely natural product that looks and feels like a Nivea product. And that was just not what we could offer at this moment. And we also didn't have the, the certifications that they wanted, such as organic certifications. Um, so we just didn't get like over the first barrier, which was very important for all the German customers, whereas for um, customers in, in Sweden and for um, yeah Southern Europe, for example, they were just much more um, inclined to just try out our products because they were green and natural and plastic free and all those things. So instead of focusing on B2B in the beginning, we decided to go for the private customers. And in uh, our case, that was Amazon, um, which we uh, um, like figured out would be the, the easiest way to start selling in, in Germany. And that turned out quite well for us. So we um, got into a program that was organized by Amazon. You can see me here with my mentor from that pro program, Anna Nordlander, she's actually Swedish um, and an expert on, on Amazon. And um, now we're also selling on, on Amazon Sweden. So this is the, the listing for, for Amazon Sweden that you can see there. And Amazon has really helped us to gain some traction in the Swedish market, in the German market. Um, and just to, to learn a lot about the, the German customers as well. Um, and what we've learned, especially um, some of the points that have already been mentioned, is that the German customers, the private customers, um, same as the, the business customers, are quite picky um, and they want the products to be perfect. And they have very uh, specific demands sometimes. And uh, they're also very price sensitive. So we actually lowered the prices for some of our products, mostly because we wanted to um, yeah, avoid customers always telling us, ah, but the competition sells uh, Nivea sunscreens, for example, for, for five euros. Um, and um, yeah, otherwise oops, we also learned that uh, you need to really take the customer feedback into account and like offer really good customer service. And of course in German, um, otherwise, the, the customers will most often just leave a, a very, very negative review. Um, and the, the upside is that the customers are also happy to recommend products when you have convinced them and when they're actually happy. And in general, we've seen that on the B2C market, we had um, quite a, a lot of success early on. And we could see that the sustain, sustainability aspect is very important for the private customers, whereas it was not so important for the B2B customers yet, at least in like 2017, 2018. Now we can also feel that it's changing a bit. Um, and now this year, we're actually for the, the first time in a much more stable position when it comes to B2B sales because we have found the right partners. <laughs> and that is really the keyword. So we've worked hard over the past three years just to get into contact with the right partners. And uh, we've received some help as well um, from Invest in Skåne, for example. They've gotten us 
uh, the contact of um, a consultancy that is based in, in Munich and run by two um, by, by a Swedish team. And they helped us to, for example, uh, get in touch with the right contact persons at the, the German pharmacies. Um, and then for the other markets, so the other or market segments, such as the natural cosmetic segment and the sports segment, we have found the right distributors. And in our case, it was also that the big distributors that we approached in the beginning, which are the easiest to find, were simply too big and not interested in at least what we could, what we could offer um, earlier. Now we have about 20 products and it's a bit more what uh, distributors are looking for. But still, the distributors that we found could make the biggest impact and that were actually interested in working with us were distributors that are, um, yeah, belong to the Mittelstand and only have a few brands in their portfolio, for example, and they're focused on the right, uh, on the right niche in the market. And now we're actually selling on like Douglas and Ecoverde, um, which are rather big cosmetics uh, online stores. And um, yeah, so in summary, what we have learned is that in the B2B market, we really couldn't make um, any impact without the right partners. But once we got the right uh, intermediaries, we could basically get into all the right channels within like a week or a month. So it really, that's the, like the turning point. Um, and um, another thing that we have noticed, which is quite unique for the German market um, and which um, I don't think has been brought up yet is that the price really is an issue in many ways. So it's not only about the fact that competition is very intense and um, you always need to argue for your price. It's also that the resellers will try to offer your products at a lower price to um, get more attention or get like the, the bid, for example, on Amazon. So you have to make sure that you uh, talk to your resellers and um, yeah, agree with them to ensure that they will always offer your products at the price that you want to sell them for to, if, uh, to like keep the, the price at a, lab, at a uh, stable level. Um, and uh, yeah, so far, what we have seen that we have been working with some German companies for a while. And it really is true that while in the beginning, it's a bit of a longer process and you have to go through some steps, you have to fill out forms um, that are not required in other countries. Um, once you work with them, you can really rely on them and you can expand the relationship and uh, it's really fun. So um, yeah. Thank you so much, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have and um, give you some more information. And you can always contact me at my email address later on as well if you want. Thanks a lot, Julia. These were very, very valuable experiences to hear about. Um, and one brief question. Would you enter the German market with the same strategy if you could redo it? Um, I think I would maybe change how we entered the B2B market. So I actually think in the beginning, because we didn't have so many products, uh, we should have focused purely on B2C and then waited with the B2B market and found out more about what uh, German B2B customers are looking for before we started approaching them. And um, then once we like had the offer that they wanted, once you had, for example, a broader portfolio, then we could have um, just approached them with that offer and it would have been easier for us, I think. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So the next guest I'm actually welcoming here in the studio, Marcus Nielsen, the senior underwriter of AKN, the Swedish export credit agency. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And Marcus will give you some concrete examples of how they can help uh, how they, they can help companies when getting established in new markets. So I will hand over the word. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Marcus Nilsson. I come from EKN, uh, the Swedish Export Credit Agency. And uh, let's see here if we have the presentation. We are uh, an authority of the Swedish government. And we do two types of businesses. Uh, it's uh, insurance operations, and we also facilitate financing. And we do this under the Kingdom of Sweden. 
As you can see in our logo, we have uh, three crowns. This means we are uh, an authority. And it also means we have um, uh, the credit rating of the Kingdom of Sweden. So we can issue very strong uh, guarantees, AAA rated guarantees. <clears throat> and we do this, our uh, main targets are uh, exporting Swedish companies and uh, their banks. And uh, we are then commissioned to promote Swedish export and uh, to enable Swedish companies to take steps on the international market. We are available for all exporting companies, <clears throat> large and small, uh, and their banks. Um, we also, it's important to, it doesn't have to be direct export. It, you can also be a supplier uh, or a subcontractor to uh, an exporting companies and uh, be, uh, be able to, to get help from EKN. EKN can help through the whole uh, export process from sales, negotiation, production, delivery to the uh, credit period. Uh, we have uh, working capital guarantees, payment guarantees, and contract guarantees. Uh, so, as you understand, we don't have money. We only have guarantees, but those guarantees we can issue to a bank that enables financing. So, first, uh, working capital guarantees. This is a bank product. The bank applies for the guarantee. Uh, if a Swedish company needs more capital to go ahead with uh, an order or uh, needs working capital, I mean, build stock, uh, employ people, uh, need to invest in uh, production, uh, scale up their, their company, they might need working capital. And the banks uh, need collateral for their, their uh, credit. So we can issue this for... Uh, for the banks to cover 50% of the bank's risk when they issue a loan or a, an overdraft facility, for example. Contract guarantees are uh, actually the most common guarantee that we issue towards Germany. Uh, this is uh, when you, as a Swedish company, sell to, uh, for example, Germany, maybe you get an advance payment from the German customer, but they need a, a, a prepayment guarantee. Then you have to go to the bank. The bank has to issue a guarantee uh, to Germany. Um, and that takes up a lot of your uh, credit space with the bank. Then ECAN can go in and cover up to 75% of the bank's risk in this um, uh, guarantee. So it's a, a guarantee for the bank guarantee. Payment guarantees is probably what uh, ECAN is most known for. This is when we secure payments from abroad to Sweden. Uh, and there are rules here uh, that we, uh, we are under because of uh, uh, if you have short-term credit uh, up to one year, normally we can't do these guarantees within OECD countries. So Europe and uh, Australia, North America. Uh, now under COVID-19, we've changed this. So we are able to do these uh, transactions uh, uh, until uh, June next year. But we also have payment guarantees that are longer, that also can, uh, and then the whole, the whole world is open. But I'm gonna go in more detail on this. So how does it work? It's a payment guarantee, uh, a guarantee for trade receivables. You have an exporter, it starts with a sales contract. And the exporter sells and the, they, to a foreign buyer. And then the risk of not being paid is on the exporter. Then the exporting company can apply to EKN to cover the risk of not getting paid. Uh, and we can issue a guarantee for up to 95% of the transaction. 
And that gives you a, a security regarding the payment, but it doesn't help you your liquidity. The thing is that you can then transfer, the exporter can go to the bank and say, hey, I have a EKN guarantee here for the payment. And the bank can use that and facilitate a loan to the exporter. So this means that the exporter can offer competitive uh, terms for the buyer in form of uh, you can give them a longer credit line, uh, credit time, and so on. So that's that's how that works. Working capital guarantee, uh, the most common guarantee in uh, in the area I work in, south of Sweden. It's like I said, uh, and a Swedish exporting company needs uh, financing. It needs uh, working capital, short, short term uh, loans or overdrafts from 12 to 24 months. And it could be for if you need to go into a new market, you have to invest in uh, employees or uh, build stock or uh, yeah, any working capital need. And then uh, we can cover the bank with 50% uh, of the loan. So we take 50% of the risk from the bank. And in this case, the bank applies for the guarantee and the bank also pays the uh, premium to EQN. So the exporter doesn't pay anything. I have two examples here for the working uh, capital guarantees. There's a company in, uh, I think it's based in Gothenburg Star Stables, they are an online uh, gaming company. They uh, got a, a deal with uh, Disney in America and uh, they needed uh, to increase their working capital for marketing and uh, to establish uh, themselves in, in USA. And they went to the bank, they got a, a credit facility that uh, EK uncovered with uh, 50%. And we have a closer example of, to where, from where we sit. It's in a company in Luma, uh, Flexbox, uh, family owned uh, business, which uh, develops and sells uh, mailboxes for uh, single houses or uh, apartment buildings. And uh, they have grown and uh, wanted to take a step on the uh, export market and uh, want to go into France and Germany and also needed uh, an extended credit facility to be able to handle this, to employ support personnel and uh, to build stock mainly. So then we covered the bank with 50% again. And we see this is uh, because for many small and medium sized exporting companies, it is hard to find uh, financing. The banks are quite tough and they of course want uh, collateral or security for for their uh, financing uh, <clears throat> last one counter guarantee i'm not going to go into detail it's quite technical product uh, this is where like i said you sell to a foreign country uh, the uh, the buyer wants a guarantee it can be a prepayment guarantee it can be a fulfillment guarantee uh, warranty guarantee, uh, which uh, the exporter has to go to the bank and, and get a guarantee. Uh, and many times the, the bank as a collateral or security, they take liquidity. Uh, and uh, if you go with EKN and you get an EKN guarantee, we can, uh, uh, the bank can uh, don't have to, to uh, use liquidity for uh, as a security. And it can work in the in the company instead. So I'm just gonna skip through this. <clears throat> so how it works? Uh, it's um, either the bank or, inter uh, when it comes to payment guarantees, it's the exporter sends in an application to EKN. We do a credit analysis, uh, and then we send out an offer to the bank or the exporter. There's a contract and you deliver according to the contract, we issue the guarantee and hopefully uh, everything goes well and uh, uh, payments are made.
but if not, then we pay out the compensation to the exporter or the bank. Yeah, this is just the world map. We do transactions with uh, pretty much all countries in the world. We have a team of uh, country anal uh, analysts in Stockholm, which uh, do uh, risk assessments on each country that uh, we have to follow regarding the premium we take, the price. But uh, pretty much all countries are open for transactions. There are a couple, North Korea, I think, uh, Iran is closed due to sanctions, but uh, most countries are open. So we strive to improve the competitiveness of Swedish companies, and uh, we want our guarantees to enable more and safer transactions. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks a lot, Marcus. And we already received one question. Yeah. Um, how much uh, does your services cost? Yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends on the product. If it's uh, the the uh, working capital guarantee, we uh, if we issue a, a guarantee of fifty percent, then the bank has to give us fifty percent of their margin towards the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a payment guarantees, it depends on the on the on the um, country. Uh, like I showed you on the map, there are different risk levels to different countries. Mm -hmm. But you can say <clears throat> if you have a payment guarantee to India for three months, I think it's about 1% of the contract okay. that it costs. But you can go inside EKN uh, online and there is, uh, you can get a rough indication of the prices on all, all different countries. Mm -hmm. You just choose country and uh, the length of the credit. Perfect, thanks a lot. And maybe briefly, um, do you mainly work with already established companies? So do you also have special offers for startups or new innovations? Yeah, we uh, historically, ECAN has been associated with the, the bigger Swedish export companies like uh, Ericsson or uh, Saab or yeah, Skåne, Volvo. Mm -hmm. uh, the last, Eight to ten years, uh, we've made a shift, so we are more focused on small and medium-sized uh, enterprises as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we we do uh, some uh, guarantees to startups and in early stages, and we are uh, probably going to get a new product next year uh, that enable us to go to take more transactions in in that uh, category of companies. But you can't be; you have to have a product, and you have to be. I mean, up and running and selling. Yeah. So we don't take any technical risks. Okay. So to say. Yeah. That, that's great to know. Thanks a lot for sharing. Um, and I'm sure your contact details can also be found on the website, probably. Yeah, so of course. If, um, more information is needed. Uh, don't hesitate to contact Ekran. And now we will continue with the program. Thanks a lot. Thank for you very much. Me here in the studio. <laughs> and. Um, Next, we will look into the legal aspects um, around entering Germany as a market. So Peter and Verena, our expert panel, they will share their experiences around the legal frameworks. Um, of course, at, at Business Suite, I can maybe give a premise. We're not legal experts per se. Um, we always say for the, for the fine lines and the, for the fine print, we advise people to actually speak to, to lawyers. Uh, and, and people who, uh, who are uh, more educated and specialized in this area. But of course, we, uh, we uh, have a lot of dialogues with Swedish companies and our clients and with, with the German counterparts. Uh, so we know what the general, general issues usually are. And um, I know that given that having a look at the participant list, I know that there are companies from a wide a range of industries and and focus areas. And I think the, the absolutely most critical advice that I can give right now would really be a very generic one, but very easy to understand as well, is to really do your due diligence. Um, use uh, a lawyer, uh, someone who knows, the, who knows the business. I think 
if I turn it around, the biggest mistake you could probably do is uh, simply work from your Swedish uh, knowledge or your Swedish agreements, or even worse, using the term wing it. Um, simply simply doing, doing it uh, what, what, what feels right. Um, take the time, and it may even cost you some, some, some money to, uh, to have a, a lawyer have a look at agreements, for instance, or, or um, if you're in the process of a certification and you really don't understand it, seek professional advice. Um, don't try to do it yourself um, if you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself. It goes a little bit, um, uh, actually, no. That was not a good reference. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Do you have anything in general that you would like to add, Verena? Um, I, I totally agree. I'm neither lawyer myself, but um, we have lawyers in-house uh, which can help you with business creation or uh, hiring people. So I asked them what they would say. And um, they said that uh, the most important thing is once you enter the German market, you are in the German legal space and that's really important for you to know and that doesn't necessarily mean the physical presence but uh, only the fact that you establish a German homepage is in the legal area and here there are a lot of traps waiting for you like the German marketing act or in Germany you always have to have an imprint in a homepage and this is extremely important because if you make a mistake here it can get very expensive you get fined and there are people out there, lawyers and advocates and consultancies that are looking actively for mistakes. And then you get it called like, it's a abmahnung, it's a legal warning and it can cost you like 10,000 euro, 100,000 euros depending on the mistake. So if you um, make a mistake here, you are easily caught. So I can only uh, confirm that was Peter said seek uh, advice from the very first uh, beginning. And um, another thing is don't forget tax issues. Legal is often uh, combined with tax issues and this is both important for you to know to get it right. But even if you uh, think of your price calculation, VAT, uh, for example, is different than uh, in, uh, in Sweden. So next I will invite Bo Odeus. He is my next guest here in the studio. Wie geht's? Good, good, and yeah. zest. <laughs> Alles gut. And uh, hello to Lena and hello to Lotte outside there. I saw two of my old colleagues and partners. Oh, yeah, that's they're very watching nice me. And I nice. can promise I will not talk more than two, three hours this time. <laughs> Please. So refill your coffee cups and. <laughs> so, Bo, um, he is the owner of Hugod AB and he is living part time in Berlin. And Hugod is a specialist consultant company in the field of international networking and cooperation. Uh, so, Bo will talk a little bit about the importance of network and how to find the right business partner. Thanks for having me here. And. Uh... We have decided to have a small chat, you and me. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, uh, and uh, a short presentation about me. Uh, let's say I have experience of doing business in Germany uh, for 25 years now. But it's not so much Germany I will talk about. It's my favorite town, Berlin, because it's Berlin where I'm doing it. So I have been uh, working in Berlin, with and in Berlin, since 2002 now. Uh, it was a result of the, the September 11th. So I, I'm an independent consultant. I'm a business consultant. And what I'm doing is I'm helping companies go in to the uh, business environment of uh, uh, Berlin technical parks, and then let's say much in the clinical sector. Uh, I'm working, let's say 75% of, of uh, my work is in, in the life science business or what we are saying med tech sector mm -hmm. and 25% uh, in the clean tech sector. And uh, often a typical customer for me, it's a Swedish company 
uh, on the stock market. Uh, we'll take the next step out, let's say, uh, to be in more international. And uh, I mean, Berlin is the right point for it because what you can build in Berlin is references for the rest of the world. Now we are talking about all technical uh, parks. We are talking about Charity, Vivantes, Deutsche Herzentrum, and so weiter, and so weiter. Mm. So, uh, and in my way of working, I'm even an investor, even sitting in in uh, as a board member in a couple of, of uh, listed companies, uh, chairman of the board, and so on. And what I have built during all these years in Berlin is the network. Let's say I'm working with, let's say, the German, the Berlin uh, decision makers directly. And I'm very independent, but I'm very operative in my way of doing business. So in the same time, it's very difficult for me to uh, talk about companies because I'm an insider in the, in the same time. So it's more about my business model, mm. how taking in companies into this environment to these leading professors in the world in charity. And let's say you have a step from Berlin out to the rest of the world. Mm. And rest of the world, okay, it's most United States. So if you have the clinical tests, the references and so on from Berlin, from this environment, then it's much, much, don't say easier, but I mean, with all respect for the quality, the German quality, and even for, if we're talking about the brands like Charité, you have door openers in the American uh, industry and, and uh, hospitals. And then, of course, we have been talking about the differences in the culture on Sveiter and Sveiter here and, and uh, even how important to work with lawyers. Mm. I have lawyers in, in Berlin. I'm working with lawyers fluent in Swedish. They are German, of course, yeah. but fluent in Swedish. So it's so important to talk about the law in the mother tongue. Mm. And that, then, that, that, then, of course, uh, I mean, for new companies, I, I mean, Berlin, it's only in the beginning of something. I mean, it's the town for young people. It's growing fast after Brexit, for example, English young people, they are moving to Berlin. And, and it's, it's, it's a reason because yeah. in Berlin that's happened yeah. because it, it, it's, it's the town for the future with all technical parks, with all these very famous hospitals. I mean, you, you have the base of it, mm. but I mean, it's so important when you are new in Berlin Network, network, network. Be on all events. I mean, you have the, the, the embassies. Mm. Go to all. Uh, say hello to people. Change cards. N network, network, network. Start running in the corridors. I'm running in corridors because I have my, my customers outside. My customer, they have their customers outside there. So, so I'm, I'm very operative in, in my way of working. So um, then when the company is listening in today and they want to uh, tap into the Berlin market, what are kind of the networking channels you would advise them to reach out to? Look into industry events or general networking. Um, now a lot shifted also to the virtual space. Um, have you made any observations there? No, not not because I, I'm a little bit conservative. Yeah. I, I'm born 60 and I'm 60. <laughs> so now I'm belonging to the, the older guys in, in Berlin. I, I'm, I'm working very traditional. Mm. Yeah. And that means that uh, my, 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 my customers, 
they're coming to me mm. and then we are going out together yeah. so let's say we do we have a product here we have a, we will see can it be something for berlin and then i checked it up let's say in my network mm. and and it's even very important to to check up the company in the same time because we are in both in berlin and germany in the same time because you must have all uh, on the table before you're going into berlin mm. it's and it's so important because it's the business culture is so different and and we're not thinking about it in 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 sweden mm. other and one of the interesting thing is that we're we're talking very much about the German language. Yeah. Of course, it's so important with the German language. But Berlin is not a German language speaking town. Mm. It's more English town because with all young people and taking Salando and all these companies, even in my sector, in the medtech sector, all are speaking English. Yeah. But I mean, will it be a little bit outside Berlin in Brandenburg? for example then you must have the the german language yeah. but the berlin today it's more like new york you have all kind of languages yeah, let, let's say <laughs> and then of course it's it's uh, berlin it's a way of living i i love the town and and uh, i and i'm i'm so proud to be a part of let's say building the the the, the town for the future and i know what projects we have around the corner mm. now so uh, i can't I, I can't tell you about them because i'm not allowed yeah. but i have them <laughs> i have them so uh, if, let's say as a business consultant uh, and so on uh, there you know where, where you have me let's say in in the environment of berlin mm. yeah and would you say then considering that berlin is very international and the startup scene in berlin is also very big is it a good first entry point for companies from sweden looking to enter the german market or do you say it's very um dependent on which industry they are in and where these respective hubs are located in germany uh, it, we don't have the industry in let's say it's more like let's say in, in in the med tech life science sector uh it media yeah, yeah of course uh, it's a town let, let's say for young people mm. here but we have still the med tech there with the medicine we have the charity uh, system i i mean when you're saying charity uh, around the world all no char yeah <laughs> Charity is, let's say, it's charity is, yeah. it's charity. Yeah. And, and, uh, and uh, I, I mean, it's a very fast growing town, still cheap, mm. still cheap. Yeah. But uh, I, I mean, the price is uh, increasing, but let's say they, they are trying to, let's say, hold the prices because young people must pay the rents, of course. and and. And 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 you you have let's say in in the Berlin business plan, it's very easy. To, it's only to read it. See that we will be the number one town in the world regarding life science, mm. for example. And I believe in in it. And and uh, but we are only in the beginning. Yeah. Where but if, let's say for the next step as a Swedish company, go into the German market, mm. Berlin. Yes because it's the most international town yeah. and and uh, I, I mean that the uh, it's so different culture between for for example München and mm. uh, uh, Stuttgart Frankfurt and Berlin it's like a day and night yeah. yes yeah, I agree. Um, and then we briefly touched about this uh, earlier and Verena mentioned it as well um, the the pre-screening that the German German companies do with uh, companies from Sweden that are asking to collaborate. 
Um, is there anything you want to share in this regard? How prepared yeah, do, uh, yes. do companies need to be when they when they reach out? Uh, to, to the moon? I'm 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 laughing because I have done the, all the mistakes. You can I have learned mm -hmm. of my mistakes, yeah. but I, 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 it was the most mistakes I learned was after the wall directly after the wall because then you had the whole world going into the former DDR. Yeah. Yes, and, and try, try to and tell, let's say, the East Germans and the Russians mm. how to, let, let's say, do business. Yeah. But, and, 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 but uh, you, it's so important to be prepared because the receivers on the other side, let's say the customers, the people you're meeting in Berlin, mm -hmm. they know much more about your company than you know yourself yeah. about your company. <laughs> but they they are playing with it. Let's say the, the 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 first hour, and then of course we can talk so much about business discussions, yeah. the differences, and where you have let's say a, a buying signal, and so Yeah. So uh, I I mean. Germany, if we're talking about Germany, Germany is maybe one of the most difficult countries in the world yeah. doing business in because the quality, mm. Ordnung most sign, yeah. yeah, there we have it. <laughs> we had one question coming in. Um, don't you agree that in times of pandemic, the Germans do find that p uh, physical meetings are most relevant, more relevant uh, than the Swedes do? It's a tough. I, I I have no answer on it directly because uh, meetings like this. It, it's uh, I, I mean in the traditional way, in the German way, yeah. close to mission impossible. Yeah, yeah uh, belonging to my generation now. Yeah. you need. But I, you, we have a, a real change in the business life mm -hmm. in Germany now. And you can see all the younger uh, CEOs, Geschäftsführers, you have a change in the companies. Mm -hmm. you, uh, uh, you have still the titles. I'm happy with the titles because it's so easy yeah. to use the titles in, in, me in, in meetings. Yeah. And then re remember one thing, business, you are only talking business in business time, mm. not outside business time. Yeah. Then you're a social player yeah. and then back uh, to the business. And then you're, you're yeah, <laughs> real there again, yeah. yes. So you have the difference be, be, because in the German system, they, you, you have all these questions, what you are interested in, mm. all other discussions yeah. and, and, and uh, not like the Swedish way, what are you working with? Yeah. No, okay. who yeah. are you? Yeah. That's the most important. Thanks a lot for sharing. That was very interesting. And we are running a bit short on time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you have any more questions, as mentioned before, just write it in the chat and uh, maybe we can get a written reply if we have time. So let's, uh, let's do a little wrap up of um, the takeaways from this webinar. So we had we mentioned before the five steps that we wanted to cover. And um, at first, we looked into the trends. Verena and Peter gave their insights on um, what Swedish services and products have actually a high demand on the German market and what kind of trends can be observed. And also what role their organizations play in, in facilitating um, reading those trends and responding to the market. And then we looked into the business culture and we learned that um, sometimes it is, it is needed to, to convey a much clearer message of um, your business than, than here in Sweden and um, to, to share your vision for collaboration uh, in a very uh, detailed way. Then we also heard um, the, the different testimonials and the learnings um, that our speakers shared with you. And of course, every company has a different journey, um, but it is very important to, to do your homework and talk to other companies who have been through the same process and um, 
share, share your experiences with others. Um, just like Julia, Jonas and Bo did uh, today, it is very helpful um, to, to share those learnings. Um, and also establish direct contacts. Uh, so seek advice from, from organizations uh, like the, um, the Swedish German Chamber of Commerce or Business Sweden, who can help you take this first step. Um, and they are also very happy to provide you with uh, contacts to other organizations who can be helpful um, along your journey. And then lastly, the financial support. Um, so ECRN, they are doing great work at um, yeah, ensuring the, the risk, the financial risk that companies uh, need to take when entering new markets. Um, and Markus Nilsson, who was with me in the studio earlier, He's also a representative for Region Skornes Export Centrum. Um, we will share a link to that in the chat and they're also very happy to facilitate. And if there are any questions that are still left unanswered, we will try our best uh, to get a written reply to you. Um, and lastly, thank you all for, for listening. Um, and a special thank you to our speakers and to the expert panel. And thanks a lot to Ideon Innovation and Ideon Science Park for arranging this webinar. The next session of Going Global will focus on the US as a market. And we will share the recordings um, of this session via email and you will also find it on ideon.se. And thanks a lot for staying with us and I hope you have a great day today. Goodbye.